Welcome, everyone. Glad you could make it so early in the morning. Um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for having me here. So it's a real pleasure. And uh, let's get started. Um, so what I want to do here today is tell you a little story about the hackathon I took part in. It was um, in the past winter, and it, it wasn't like an intensive two-day hackathon. It was something bigger. It was uh, based online, and it ran for several months. So basically, anybody could participate. and was organized by IBM. Uh, it had like nearly 600 participants. So I never dreamt of winning anything there. Uh, actually, I was lucky enough to, to win two main prizes, but I'm not here to brag about this. I'm here to, to inspire you. So I would like you to get out from here and uh, with energy saying, yeah, I want to try something like this. I want to, well, have an adventure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a brief story. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Radek Kostrowski. Um, my company is Fast Data Limited. I'm the big data engineer. Um, I also work with Toptal. Uh, Toptal is an agency which, lets you ha which helps you find uh, work remotely. So basically, you can be living wherever you are, wherever, wherever you want. You can be sitting on the beach. And uh, as long as you have internet access, you can be earning good money. Uh, so I think this is quite cool. And uh, so yeah, what I did last winter was this. I, was, uh, I stayed for three months on the Caribbean coast of Colombia, like 400 meters from a beach, and working from a hammock. So I had a part-time job at the time. And then I figured, why not? I can just enter the hackathon as well. And, uh, and it was well worth it. And here is the link if anybody is interested to know more. And you can come and approach me afterwards as well. Um, right, so I heard somewhere that uh, you should start with the last slide first. So here it is. This is the last slide. Um, what I would like to tell you is that you should really follow your dream. So some of you might be dreaming of, about living in a, in a perfect place, somewhere in a paradise, and then just working from there. And this is not something that's um, impossible. Many people do it. Many people live in Thailand or in South America, and they just travel around the world. They're so-called digital nomads. And, and you're, you can just keep on working and earning good money. So uh, this is definitely possible. So follow your dreams. Um, there are many resources for you to do that. Um, D stands for DevPost. This is the organizer of the hackathon I took part in. Um, so if, if you're happy where you are, then maybe, well, you don't have to travel, but maybe you have some idea, or maybe you have some pet project that you would like to um, take forward. You would like to expand on it, build it up, see how it goes. But you can't find time to do this, because maybe you're too busy working, or you have a busy family life, and so on. So participating in one of the, with those hackathons could be very good. It could like help you to put your, your, your project on schedule. You, you could be motivated by, uh, by having some competition or maybe by financial reward afterwards. Um, so this, I found it good for me to, uh, to keep motivated to work on my project, to work on my idea. And uh, lastly, if, if you don't have any idea at the moment, but maybe there are some uh, technologies that you would like to try out, something that uh, you can do in your everyday job, then this is another opportunity to enter a hackathon. So maybe you could uh, yeah, learn a new tool or uh, try something that you always wanted, but you don't really have time. So uh, for me, actually, it was all of those things. So I wanted to travel and live re work remotely. I wanted to participate in a hackathon. And I had a, a neat idea, which I will tell you about. And I wanted to try, try out those technologies. So it all worked out for me was good timing. Um, actually, that's it. I'll <laughs> so you can go now <laughs> with the last slide. Uh, right, uh, today's story. So uh, I'll tell you briefly about how it all started. I kind of already did. Um, then uh, there'll be a quick demo. 
and I will like share like high level overview of the architecture. Uh, then a little bit about Docker and Spark, and some tips on uh, participating in a hackathon. Uh, maybe if I can ask you by, uh, if you can raise your hand, if you came here f for this talk mainly because you wanted to learn about Spark. Thank you, Paul. Okay, what about uh, Docker? Did you come here for Docker? Or did you come here for Hackathon? Okay, so that's a mixed audience, very good. So it'll be a little bit of everything. Um, so how it all started, IBM, like last year, they, they really believed in the power of Spark, so they started investing in it. So uh, they, were, they were setting up technology centers all over the world, investing in people that know Spark, and they pay good money for it. Um, so for them, um, doing some marketing, and then you know, at the same time, they also bought the, the weather company. And this is like one of the biggest resources out there to help you predict weather. And you know, was, was the weather forecast. So somebody from IBM must have thought, uh, oh, well, we can just run this hackathon, right? So we'll just ask people to use Spark. So then we can advertise our services. And then at the same time, uh, for the project, they should use some weather data. So then it's also we'll publicize that we actually bought them and, uh, and see what happens. Um, so they contacted DevPost, the organizer of the hackathon, and then they set it up. And uh, they call it the Sparkathon. It's raining data. So basically, the main rules of the hackathon were uh, you have to use Spark, you have to use weather data, and you have to run on IBM platform, which was provided for free for the participants. And then just, yeah, the rest is up to you. See what you can come up with. Um, I'll show you the DevPost page later. So what, what was my idea? Uh, I think normally if you, if you want to go for holidays and you would expect to have a certain type of weather, you would think, OK, maybe I want super sunny and definitely no rain. This is the case for most of the people living in the UK. I live in Scotland, so it's raining a lot. So people just say, yeah, I definitely don't want rain, and I want to have lots of sun. And then uh, you might think, OK, so uh, maybe I'll go to Malta, because it's always sunny there. But then you check the weather forecast for the next week, and it's raining the whole week, which doesn't happen always, but it happens. So then you might think of another city. But the weather might not be what you would expect. So um, the idea, the pitch project for the, the elevator pitch for this was uh, basically you define what the perfect weather means for you, what type of weather you want. And then the, the tool, the service, will present you with a ranked list of cities matching your weather. And uh, it's also hooked up with, a, with Skyscanner, which is like a search engine for cheap flights. And then so you can also try to find what's the cheapest price to get you there to your perfect destination. So the, the idea is quite simple, but uh, uh, I think it's also quite original. I, I was surprised that there are tools like this out there. Um, this is the logo that my wife designed. I really like it, so I, I thought I'm going to show it here. Um, the service is uh, it's running; it's for free, so you can you can have it have a go. Um, there are still some bugs, but as always. Um, but if you're interested, you can visit myperfectweather.eu. Um, so I'll show you a quick demo. So basically, this is the page. Um, I have some uh, preset buttons. Um, first, people I, I showed it to, they, they thought it would be quite fiddly to start playing with all those controls of the temperature, precipitation type, and so on. So you can just start by pressing a button at the top. And uh, warm, sun, and dry is the most popular. Um, and then it will set the buttons in a certain way. And then you can go and adjust it and play around. So it's, it's temperature, it's precipitation type. You can also choose like cloud cover, wind speed, humidity. And uh, what it does is, yeah, I get the weather data from IBM, the weather company, and, uh, and Skyscanner is the, um, the flight search engine. So let, let's try to use it. Let's see what it tells us today. So warm, sunny, sunny and dry. 
play around with temperature. Um, you can choose the airport if you are interested in flying. If you're just interested to know what cities might have the weather that you want, it, it, just, it doesn't matter what airport, you can just leave whatever is here. Um, So let's, let's see what it will tell us. Um, so there, it's, it's a list of, uh, of several cities. Basically, the, the star you see on the left, and there is a number, so it, this, this represents the, the amount of perfect days. So the days with the blue background are the ones that match the query. As we see here on the top is a faro in Portugal where uh, only one day Friday doesn't, doesn't match your query. And this is because I can see it has uh, like a 10% 10, 10 chance of rain. So it's not linked there. And uh, here you see the description for every day of the weather forecast. The, the drawback here is that once you get be beyond a week, really, the weather forecast is not really good. So this is really like a tool for the, for the nearest future. Um, this could be potentially extended by adding like some yearly averages for months and so on later on. But then, uh, and it's a guesswork really. And so apart from the cities that, uh, I think by default I just put 10 cities out here. I also do a quick search for the cheapest prices and you can find. So for example here, the cheapest price found on this route was one day ago, and it was 219 pounds. Um, the second one, flying to Turkey, was 121 pounds, found fi five days ago. So you're really unlikely to pay this, but you'll pay more, a bit more, because uh, this is like the cheapest price found. And, uh, and if you're interested to, let to know me more, you could just click here on the play button, and you get redirect to Skyscanner. It prefills the dates and the destinations. Um, of course, you can change the dates, and then you can look for cheaper prices. Actually, it's what it said. Look, so you can fly tomorrow to Turkey for 185 pounds. Um, and there is this neat tool, find lowest prices. Normally, it's pre-filled with the, like a, the bar chart so you'd see which days are more expensive so you can adjust your query and to optimize. And then you just click here and then you can buy a ticket straight away. Um, as you see, it's very simple. It just like, kind of gives, gives you ideas on destinations. But uh, I didn't see any tool like this out there, so I thought it might be worth a try. And then uh, I submitted this to this Hackathon, and then I was successful. So uh, just so briefly about DevPost, they run lots of different hackathons. Um, we could have a look at uh, what hackathons are running at the moment. So there are quite a lot of them. The thing is most of them are, are local, so you would have to go to like somewhere here. You have to go to Barcelona to participate. So this is not always viable for everybody. But they also have those online hackathons. Um, there are four at the moment. No, normally, it's, it's a bit more. Um, but this one is quite interesting. For, it's a, it's, it runs in Morocco, and you should help them find like an optimal way to uh, for taxi drivers to like to schedule the route as they pick up people and drive around and so on. And uh, this one is something to do with uh, with flights. Um, yeah, you could, I think uh, if you, maybe not necessarily you'll find a hackathon of interest the first time you go to this page, but if you just bookmark it somewhere and come back to it in a month, there might be something that, that you really would like to do. And uh, some of them have, are for free or for some simple rewards, and some of them like, have good prizes, like this one. You can win like $100,000 in total. So. Um. So this was the, the hackathon I participated in. Uh, yeah, there were 573 people that took part. And this is my submission. 
basically, as one of the rules is that you have to do a short video. Um, so then the judges can, can look at it instead of like looking through source code and so on. And uh, just uh, so you know, it took me like a week to do just a stupid five minute video. And it took me two weeks to do the whole app. So <laughs> as you can see, I'm not a <laughs> video maker. Um, so you, you, can, you can have a read here if you're interested, but uh, it's out there. Um, right, I think let's, let's it demo-wise. So um, a little bit about the architecture. It's actually very simple, and it was kind of enforced on me a bit by, by the competition itself. So I have to run in the Bluemix platform, so it's the IBM cloud service. And uh, so the weather API is just like a REST for service. You can query. Basically, you just give it a, like latitude and longitude for the place that you're interested, and you'll get the weather forecast for this. And uh, you can choose if you want like very detailed weather for very near future, for a few hours from now, or for tomorrow, or for three days, or what I'm using is the, the 11 days forecast. Um, so I would have a play, play app and Scala running inside of a Docker container, and it, it's deployed in the, in the Bluemix service. And uh, the app, what would do, once per day, it would download all the, all the raw weather predictions for all the cities of interest. Then it would push it into Clodent, which is kind of like MongoDB JSON, JSON store, but it's a distributed database running in Bluemix as well. And then at the time, I had to use a Spark notebook. Uh, as there was no integration, you cannot just upload your source code to run your Spark code. You had to use a notebook. Uh, but now they added it in as well. So um, but basically, what I'm using Spark as an ETL tool. It will fetch all the raw weather data. It will parse it. Uh, it will extract all the relevant information I want. And then it will push it back to the database. So then when a user navigates to the website, um, a query is run against a cloudant, And then the results ca come back, and they are presented on the website. And then. Um, Skyscanner is an external tool that y you saw how you can get to it. So just you click on, and then you get redirected to another page. Um, just to say, like the whole app is like, if I don't count the HTML and JavaScript for the first page, like everything is like not more than 200 lines of code. So it's very simple. Um, so let's let's start with Docker. Uh, as they say. As the saying goes, the best things in life come in small containers. So I think uh, Docker is a really good tool there. Um, are, are you, have anyone here used SBT plugin for, for Docker? Uh, not many. Nobody, actually. So uh, I found it by accident, but I think it's really, really cool. So uh, in my case, I have, this, um, I have this play app, which runs my code and so on. But then how do I go to have it running in Docker? So I could start writing on my Docker file, making sure I have some special script that will execute the service, and so on and so on. And with this plugin, it's just a one command line. I'll show you what it is, but it's very easy. And uh, it, it lets you change your build process for your project. So start by starting with your code, and executing one line with, with SBT, not only you build everything, but also you end up with a container that you can just run straight away. So it was very quick for me to, to just use it to, to test out the app. Um, and it runs in the IBM container service. And what I also did here, I tried to run the same uh, Docker image in, um, in uh, Docker Cloud, so I just took Whatever I had, I connected to AWS with Docker Cloud. I pushed it, and it worked straight away. So this is like a power of Docker. If once it's running in one, then it will run on every other cloud platform that supports it. Um, so um, what do you have to do with this uh, SBT plugin? Um, you just add several, command, several um, 
parameters to your, to your build file. Some of them are optional, like uh, the Docker base is optional, and maintainer, and so on, and so on. Um, so rea realistically, you could just not, en not add anything, and it will still work. Uh, if you're interested, it will generate a Docker file for you, and then it will use it to, to build everything out. But you don't really have to see this. Um, so the, the command is um, sbt docker publish local, and it basically builds your whole project, and then it creates a container, shoves all your code into it with all the dependencies, and it creates a startup script that if you run the container, the script gets executed, and script has all the parameters to run your Docker container and set it up, and, um, and off you go, your play app is working. So I found it really useful. Um, then if I were to deploy it in Bluemix, um, they have some CloudFormation tools that you can install. So you just have to log in, and then you can push, uh, push it to the, to the service. So basically, you have to rename it first, and then you push it to the cloud. And uh, you can start it both by uh, command line or from the user interface, and as they're running. And uh, the only time, like the longest what it takes is actually to push your image. But then if you've already done it before, it will be only the, the layer of changes. And otherwise, it's just, it can be seconds. And you have your, your new image running in the cloud. So I think it's quite powerful. Uh, just out of interest, this is like a UI for running your containers in Bluemix. Um, the thing which is not quite so easy to do via the command line is to add extra services. So for example, here, I would normally start it with the UI, and I would add uh, like the weather service or the, the database service so it works together with my, with my container. Right, are, are there any questions for Docker? Right, we can take them later. So, Spark, um, how I use Spark here is I don't really take all advantage of, of what it takes, of what it can give me, what it can provide me. It's such a powerful tool. And uh, I don't really have a big data set. It's just a few JSON files for all the cities that I want to use. So basically, uh, you could use anything else here, because all the, all the data fits on one machine. But, uh, if potentially I wanted to take it further, if I wanted to run all this prediction for all the cities in the world, and maybe try to come up with something smarter, do it in a streaming fashion, add some uh, machine learning algorithm, maybe try to predict and recommend to people the destination that they would like based on other factors, then uh, Spark could come in really useful. Uh, what, what I will briefly show you is uh, how very quickly you can take some raw JSON files and turn it into something useful with Spark. So I'll use a Spark notebook for this. Um, I'm doing good on time. Can you guys see it at the back? Um, so basically, it's like a Spark notebook. Is uh, it comes from a Python notebook? It's it's something that runs in your browser, and then, then it connects to a Spark server running somewhere behind the scenes, and it ships it all the commands that you want to execute it. And it keeps track of everything that run in a special context. So then, just directly from your browser, you can run all the code you want, and you can basically connect. If you have a huge cluster somewhere, you can connect to it from your browser and, and run different jobs. And uh, I find it particularly useful for doing presentations like this. So it's a code that's already tested, so it's kind of a live coding, but you know it should be working. Um, so you execute the cell by pressing Shift Enter. Um, so what we'll do here, we'll just download the, the weather data set I have prepared. Um, And the really cool thing I found about Spark is that it supports multiple um, data formats. So here I just tell it, uh, the file is JSON, just read it in for me. And then it will read it into a data frame. And I don't really have to tell it anything. I don't have to tell it about uh, the data types or anything. It will just infer most of it itself. Um, 
So let's have a look. Let's just display one entry of, of what it is. Um, so this would be a JSON file. Here is presented slightly different in the form of a table. But you can see there is a, like an ID field, an airport field, and country. Those are the extra things I added. But then the forecasts and the metadata, it's uh, the original thing that comes from the weather service. So this is just one entry. And you can see there's like quite a lot of stuff happening there. Um, not so easy to understand straight away. So let's see how many of the entries I have. 101. So it's 101 cities that we'll be looking at. Um, so I did all the hard work for you over here. I extracted all the meaningful, um, meaningful attributes that, that we can actually use. Um, and interestingly, you could do a SQL type queries and then go deeply inside of the object. So it's a layered JSON object. So you have like a parent and a child and so on and so on. But inside of a SQL-like query, you can go inside of it and you can extract the fields from within. Um, so let's see how it looks now. Um, a bit more legible, so DOW is a day of the week, so you can see it's an array of 10 or 11 um, entries. So it will be like local time, num, max temperature, min temperature, and so on. Um, notice here, the first entry is missing. The, it's because the first entry is for today. And if you're interested in the long-term weather prediction, you don't really care about the weather for today. So sometimes it's missing uh, the first entry. And it's also, if you run the query like in the evening, then it doesn't really matter what the weather was because it's no longer a prediction. Um, so what I do here, I try to predict like from tomorrow. So, every, so we just skip the first entry in all of the rows. Um, and some other attributes is the, uh, like wind speed, HI, this is like the perceived temperature, um, the wind direction, and, and there are some other things as well. Um, what they do, they also give you an icon code, uh, which is quite neat. Um, it comes with a bundled set of icons for the weather, so you know, like the sun and the cloud and the uh, thunder and so on. So you don't have to do it yourself. You just have to get the number, and then you can populate it with the correct image. Um. So this is the, the most complicated part of, <laughs> of the whole project, I think, the cell. And basically what I do here, I create a case class from the interested parameters that I really need. And then I go through every, through every row and then through every array inside of every row, and I extract it. So I come up with a bigger list of all the singular entries of, for every day. And what it will look like is something like this. Um, so this is actually something that we can use for uh, finding our perfect weather. So you have yeah, the, the day of the week and all the parameters. And then here it says, OK, so this is for Alicante. So this is the next 10 days weather prediction for Alicante. And then it will be for other cities. Next one is Amsterdam and Athens and so on. So it's the finale. We can yeah, try to look for our perfect weather. Um, here, you, you can just run a SQL query if you want to. So here I say the main temperature should be bigger than 20 and cloud cover smaller than 30 and uh, zero chance of rain. Um. So here it is. Um, we have six matches. Two, two, two days for Athens, two days for Palermo, and two days for Valletta. Um, so here you couldn't really know, if you really wanted to go somewhere for holidays, probably two days of your perfect weather wouldn't be enough. But if it were, then you could check the, the, the price of the flight, which one is cheaper, and decide to go there if you wanted. Um, if you're interested in flying a kite, 
So let's say you promised your, your child that you will fly with them and you teach them how to fly a kite and then you check the weather forecast for the place where you live and there's absolutely no wind, then uh, you might run this query, just check where the wind is between 16 and 32 kilometers per hour and then if you have money and time, fly there with your child to show them how to fly a kite. Um, so what else I do here? I just count by the amount of days that, that find the query straight away. So here, again, Alicante comes up as perfect in this case, and uh, yeah, the list of other cities. And um, lastly, if you are interested maybe in going fishing, uh, then probably you want the sky to be a bit cloudy so it's not too sunny, so fish don't, don't hide too deep in the water. Uh, of course, you would need also <laughs> a place where, where you have water. It doesn't provide this, but anyway, just out of curiosity, uh, what it would give us is a list of other cities. And I had to mess with this query a bit, because I'm, actu I'm actually from Torun, so <laughs> I wanted it to, to show up on the, <laughs> the results bit, but here it is. Uh, as you see, like, I'm not using huge data sets, and I don't have a distributed cluster running behind it. it everything runs on my machine. But uh, Spark can be also useful in just doing simple ETL jobs because of the amount of uh, like tooling it has and the data formats it supports. Um, right, so let's get back to the query, to the presentation. Um, maybe to sum up this weather prediction and so on, this is a, a very nice use case, I think. Um, if you were testing your new umbrella and you lived in in Canary Islands, then how can you do that? You have to go and enter under the shower or something, I don't know. So this girl here, she actually tried the My Perfect Weather app and uh, it showed her that Edinburgh is the, is the place where you're almost guaranteed to have rain. So she, fle she flew over and she and her cat are happy because the umbrella is working nicely. And uh, those guys on the sides, probably one of them is me, like in the rain, um, not very enthusiastic. All right, so this is like the last part of the talk. I want to tell you briefly about the hackathon aspect of it. Um, as I already mentioned, it wasn't something like this, like you see here. It wasn't all packed in like a few days. It was the online hackathon. Um, oops. But maybe before you decide to enter one, you can ask you this question. Should you enter a hackathon in the first place? Um, well, you should like the initial idea of it in the first place. So if it doesn't sound right, then yeah, just, just skip it. Don't waste your time. Um, then a second really important aspect is the time. So do you really have time to work on it? It's not just, uh, well, I enter the hackathon and then I will win. Yeah, you need to work on it. So be sure you can put it in your schedule. Uh, because I work remotely all the, all the time, it gives me a bit more flexibility. But you might be able to do the same. You might be able to work weekends or evenings or I don't know. Uh, but you have to know that you need time to work on it. Um, what else? You, you must feel enthusiastic about it, right? If you just enter it just because I enter because it will be good for me, then I don't think it's going to work out. Uh, you must really want to do it. and. Um, well, feel motivated, or by the challenge itself, or by the technical stack, or by the technologies you can use. And um, lastly, but I think the most important part of it is uh, that you should feel that you are doing something creative, or that you are learning something. Because uh, the probability that you win the hackathon, I think it's quite low in general. Depends how many participants are. But here, there were like 600, so I would never expect that I will win. Uh, but what's the most important is that, for me, this was like the best project I worked on. Like I worked on many projects, but this is the one I enjoyed most. It was my idea. I could choose technologies I wanted. I learned a lot, and I really enjoyed it. So for me, this is like an award on itself. So if you think this will happen to you, then just go and start it and work on it. And uh, at the end, maybe you'll win, maybe you won't. Who knows? But at least you know you didn't waste your time, and you learned something. So uh, how to win a hackathon? This is like a um, few tips I came up with. Um, so the first one is uh, treat it as your normal job. So don't just, 
I don't know, work on it five minutes per day and then just ignore it. Like if you are, if you want to win, it's your job. You have to dedicate. So you focus on it, and you, you treat it as a real job. Well, there is nobody standing behind you, but that's what it is. It, that's what it takes for you to to win something. And the next tip is uh, you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Uh, and so in my case, for example, I'm a terrible UI designer. I'm a backend developer. Uh, so. I would basically spend two weeks just doing the website, and then um, one other rule of the competition was that it had to be it had to be running on mobile devices. So then I figured, well, if I start doing now uh, like an iOS app for this, I will never finish. So basically, I just took a, a template, some open template from somewhere that was scaling for for mobile devices as well. And I used it, and that's it, and it's working. So I just found the one which was the, as close to what I wanted to look like, and then changed some images, and now it's, uh, it's done. But you need to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, another tip, uh, this is, I think, optional. <laughs> some of us think that like, having the idea is the most important part, but no, no it's not. It's, uh, it's how you execute it. Um, what I think is also important is that you look at the judging criteria, because this is how, at the end, you're, you're, you'll be ranked. Um, so don't just get carried away with your work, and yeah, you're work, working, you're doing whatever, and you're so happy, and then you forgot that, uh, for example, your app had to run on mobile devices, or it had to do something. So make sure you, you look at the rules and, um, and look at the judging criteria. Um, yeah, so you don't make, miss the requirements. So th they are kind of similar, those two. And um, lastly, schedule. Make sure you plan it so you don't run over time. If you submit your application two seconds too late, then you're out. So it's better to submit early than late. Um, and actually, what comes behind this is like a strategy to, that you can apply to many projects. Is this uh, minimum viable product rule whereby you start with something small, something working, and then you add on to it. You add an extra feature. So then, uh, for example, in my case, would be one day I, I added uh, search just for the temperature. So then I could see the cities by temperature, and then I added more, and so on. So basically, you start small, and you build up. Uh, if uh, well, the time runs out at, uh, on three, three there, four here, uh, Basically, somebody has an unfinished product, they will submit it to the competition and it will get rejected straight away because it doesn't work. But if you submit, I don't know, the, the motorcycle or the, or the bicycle, and the competition run out of time or whatever, you might be, you might be the winner of the competition. So uh, start small and build up. And, uh, and then you use all those rules and you win it, right? You'll get the main prize. Uh, so I wish this was so simple. Uh, it depends on many things. And it depends on the what mood the judges are on the day when they are doing the, looking at the videos or uh, those things like that. But I think it really depends on your competition, so how good they are, what type of project they submitted, and so on. Um, so it, at the end, it's down to luck. But uh, if you did this project because you really enjoyed it and because you learned something new, you're the winner already, right? So all the prizes or whatever is just a cherry on a, on a already good cake. Uh, so as you might imagine, when I saw another Spark competition coming up, I was super excited. Yeah, I'm going to win this. I will apply all these uh, tips and all the experience I learned. And uh, so I submitted. I actually submitted even two projects. I said, yeah, like this, I'll increase my chances. Uh, and uh, another motivation here was this. For this hackathon, the main prize was $50,000. So I was like, wow, so like, this is like my dreams. Uh, and uh, I didn't win. But uh, like the judges just decided that uh, the competition was better. And I agree that, that they had really good projects. But uh, what I did win was a, a public award. So people that voted, they decided that my app was the best. So I didn't win 50,000 pounds, $50,000, but uh, I won something. 
And、uh, this is like、uh, three days ago. I flew to、uh, New York to get the prize. So、uh, I had a big check that I received on the stage, and then I could like show it off in,、uh, in New York. So it was quite cool. But、uh, anyway, I had fun while working on a project. So I think this is the most important thing.、Uh, So basically, what I want you to take away from here is、uh, feel inspired, have have dreams, and then just go and try them.、Um, everything is easy. I think、uh, most of us here are programmers, and we are so、uh, so lucky that we can do whatever we want. We can be traveling the world, living in Thailand, and things like this, and、uh, keep on earning good money. So, and hackathon is a、uh, one way of、uh, on fulfilling yourself. With the project-wise and technologically and so on. So that's me. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, there is somebody there. Spark Notebook. Hello. Spark Notebook is free or not? Yes, it's free. Uh, so I know that Databricks were actually wanted to sell it. So I'm not.、Uh, okay. So、um, when I say Spark Notebook, I actually mean the tool called Spark Notebook. This is also like a category of tools.、Uh, so there are several. The, like the Databricks Cloud is a kind of a Spark Notebook which runs and is hosted by Databricks. There is a Spark Notebook called Zeppelin. There is Spark Notebook called Jupiter, and there is Spark Notebook called Spark Notebook. So that's the the last one I use here. And、uh, yeah, it's it's open source. You can download it. And actually, this presentation、uh, it's submitted there as open source. So if you download the main, you can you can play around with this code as well. Thank you. All right. So, thanks for attending.